Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Name Dragon, and I need to start out this video with a bunch of explanation, possibly even backstory. We are here today, courtesy of Godless Cranium, Shannon Q, Emperor Atheist, and their maddening hangout with the inimitably insufferable Max Colbay. I'll give you a short taste of what we were all subjected to from that live stream. That would be your mind since the, since to this day, no one in doing neurocognitive research can, can really support the idea that your mind, your awareness, your perception, let's say, of the color green or red or blue um, is simply some kind of emergent effect of electrochemistry or shit. That's not science at all. And that's not, that's, that's, just a belief. It's not even, it's not even not only not provable, I'll show you copious science in the peer review research that de demonstrates that your mind, at least in part, probably exists outside the, the laws of physics. Now, everyone participating in the Hangout and everyone watching quickly did the proper thing and demanded Max support his claim with some kind of legitimate, respectable scientific source. And so he promised to do. Just really quick, Savage Atheist um, asked uh, asked a question about your peer reviewed. Uh, he said, uh, "Cite your peer reviewed studies that the mind exists outside the laws of physics." You're not just getting away with a comment like that. Sure enough, when he mirrored the hangout on his own channel, he included links to a number of YouTube videos. Uh... Just a quick note, Max had Shannon and Cranium's permission for mirroring the video, so nobody give him any crap over that. On the other hand, his support from the peer-reviewed literature are videos posted on YouTube. That's right. Not scientific papers that build a case through the peer review process, not even academic works by respected and reputable authors. But at least we can say that one of those videos, which actually turned out to be a four-part series called The Case for the Soul, did build its arguments off of the work of scientists and leveraged their peer-reviewed findings. The case for the soul is what we're going to be looking at in this series of videos. Dr. Long and Sheldrake each deserve their own dedicated videos. Well, series possibly, because there is a lot wrong with both of them. I've dug through the case for the soul to find and front load what appears to be inspiring philosophy's hypothesis, which we will then test against the evidence that he presents. It is not my intention to straw man, but to steel man inspiring philosophy. However, he never outright defines his terms or presents a consolidated hypothesis, and so I'm forced to guess that what he presents as explanations of the evidence that lead him to posit a soul exists are what we should take as his core claim. So bear with me as we examine the claim that science supports the belief in a soul. But given the options of dualism and physicalism, neither can fully satisfy both sides of the evidence. If the mind is just the effects and creation of the brain, it should be completely subject to the physical brain activity. But if the mind is a separate substance, the properties of the mind should be preserved from physical damage. If the physical can damage the mind, then they share common properties and are not separate substances after all. Can we find a theory which can explain all this data? Given the options of substance dualism and physicalism, neither of which can fully explain the evidence, a third option of idealism can. Instead of the mind being a separate substance, or an illusion of brain chemistry, the mind is what is fundamental, and the brain is an emergent construct of the mind. Now I don't have a lot to say here, because he built his video to lead up to his hypothesis instead of explaining what he was talking about and then justifying the claim with evidence. That being said, I do agree with him that dualism cannot explain the current evidence, and appears to be falsified by what we already know. I say this for the same reason Victor Strenger rules out all Judeo-Christian God hypotheses. Dualism requires we have some non-physical stuff somehow reliably interacting with physical stuff. That is to say, if you have an immaterial soul that controls your decisions and actions, it must somehow push electrons or chemicals in your brain to make that happen. The spirit must have observable effects on the material for substance dualism to work, and the standard model of physics has only four means for anything to have an effect on the material. Gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear forces. 
There is no evidence of an unexplainable immaterial impact on these forces and the particles they manipulate. There are more objections to dualism which you can check out in the works of Stranger and Sean Carroll. Links to those in the description. As for claiming that physicalism cannot explain mental phenomena, I'm going to address the details of his evidence from this video later in the series. For now, I'm just going to tip up my hand and point out that this is an argument from ignorance and lies. A spiritualism of the gaps, if you will, because all inspiring philosophy manages to do is present a paper that misrepresents its own sources and gaps in our current knowledge. Seriously, the paper he references outright lies about its claims. But what more can inspiring philosophy say about his hypothesis? This means we can explain how the mind is able to causally affect aspects of the brain while not being ontologically separate. The mind is able to mold itself through conscious efforts and produce real effects perceived in the brain. But the physical emergent brain is not in a separate world, because if idealism is true, then monism is true. So meddling with the brain is not a separate substance from the mind. And here we come to the big point, I suppose. If monism is true, then one of two things follows. Either materialism and idealism are indistinguishable. Occam's razor would then recommend we accept materialism over idealism, since it requires fewer assumptions to say that everything arises from the one thing which we actually observe, the material world. Or materialism and idealism produce different predictions and you can test it. Hopefully, the rest of this hypothesis will explain how we can differentiate between materialism and idealism, and then offer solid, reasonable predictions which we can test. Is that the end of our hypothesis, though? Oh, hell no. Buckle up, kiddos, because this is where the woo starts flowing free. Brain damage and alterations make sense in idealism. The philosophy boils down to the idea there is a mind and the experience of reality, which we call the physical world but would essentially just be information and experiences the mind interprets and processes. This would be a dual aspect idealism in a sense, instead of a substance dualism. So an information loss or alteration will affect how the mind processes and functions in the experience of reality. Except that all of this makes sense under materialism with aspect monism. There's no reason to posit idealism or aspect dualism to explain these phenomena. In fact, they're necessary under materialism. In case anyone doesn't know what he means by dual aspect idealism, he is saying that there are mental and physical properties to a single substance, that substance being mind stuff, for want of a better term. The physical world is in essence a projection of all of our minds and presumably the mind of God. However, we, you have a problem with this. How do the different aspects of your dual aspect idealism interact. What is the cause and what is the effect? Define the necessary properties of each and develop a predictive nature of this model. Something all dual aspect monists ignore is that they have precisely the same problems as dual substance philosophies, which inspiring philosophy agreed fail for that very reason. So, since you reject substance dualism as impossible, I have to reject your dual aspect philosophy as well. They fall at the same hurdle. So far, your hypothesis is already falsified by your own arguments. Can you save it? For example, if I fall off a building, I'll experience injury. I won't say it is just information and will not affect me. The information is real to the mind and affects how the mind functions in its experience. Think of that line from The Matrix. I thought it wasn't real. Your mind makes it real. If you have to quote The Matrix to defend your theism, you are clearly doing something wrong. That being said, if your mind makes it real as you claim, there is no reason your mind cannot make a full recovery of the brain and body real. This is why materialism is more sound than idealism. In materialism, the mental activities of your brain necessarily modify the brain, but within the very circumscribed limits based on the material nature of everything involved. In idealism, the mind reigns supreme. Your brain exists as a projection of the mind, as inspiring philosophy himself has said. There exists no fundamental reason your mind could not build you a new body after vaporization. I'm willing to entertain the notion that the mind lacks the causal powers to repair the brain, but you're going to have to explain all 
of these interactions as part of your hypothesis. In order to try and get a complete view, I've got a few clips from your third video, well, really just one, which attempts to tie this discussion into quantum mechanics. I don't think you're going to salvage this mess, but let's give you your best shot. If the brain emerges from quantum computing, the same quantum rules and effects apply, and the implications of the measurement problem apply to the brain as well. The brain has several different pathways along its microtubules in a quantum superposition, then we must ask what is causing measurement and final collapse. The implications we see in quantum experiments would carry over to quantum biology. The wave function of the material brain is collapsed by the mind or the observer. The implications from experiments in quantum mechanics disagree with you. On so many levels, you're talking about the observer effect. In quantum mechanics, this is also known as the measurement problem. And you know what? It doesn't imply, mean, or refer in any way to a conscious observer. The practical reality is that to take a measurement on a quantum level, you have to interact with what you want to measure. All interactions cause reactions analogous, but not identical to Newton's third law. This is all we're seeing happen. No need for consciousness, as almost every interpretation of quantum mechanics acknowledges. You are in the Deepak Chopra fringe of quantum mechanics. So I'll let Neil deGrasse Tyson explain it better than I could. So we'll okay, get, so we'll here it is. So I'm looking at you, okay. all right? Yes. And I see you. I want to know where you are. So I turn on the lights and I say, there you are. All right. Now, let's make you tinier. Let's make you mini me. Okay, like in the movie. Um, right. So now there's a tiny version of you, a mini me version of Joe Rogan. Now you're little. I turn on the lights, you're still there. Okay. Okay. Because if the lights are not on, I can't see you. I don't know where you are. Right. It's that simple. Okay. Okay. When you start becoming the size of molecules, right on down to the size of an atom, and I ask the question, where is Joe Rogan the atom? And I turn on the light to see you there, because I think you're there. The light, the photon comes in, hits your atom, and pops you into another location. Mm. The very act of trying to measure your position prevents me from measuring your position. And it has have jack shit to do with your consciousness, or your mind, or your eyes, or anything. It has to do with the fact that to know you're there, some information has to come from you to me, like shining a light on you. And the smaller you are, the more susceptible you are to the, the, the energy of the light changing your position in space. Now at this stage, I can already call the hypothesis not only improbable, but effectively falsified. By his own arguments, inspiring philosophy has stated that there cannot be a duality to the nature of reality. He tries to weasel out of this by arguing for dual natures rather than dual substances, but it makes no functional difference. His claim that idealism better explains how thinking affects the brain is not unreasonable, but materialism also explains this since an emergent mind from matter would have to have the capacity to perform right cycles on the structure of the brain. Further, under idealism, we could reasonably predict that the mind could alter the apparent matter in any way it wished. Materialism, to the contrary, would constrain the mind's functions to networked activity of different segments of the brain and the ability to modify the brain only in manners that are necessary for any such feedback system. This means that materialism is a simpler explanation for the limited activity of the mind on the brain and body, unless we are presented with evidence that something the mind does to the physical world exceeds what would be allowable under materialism. Finally, his representation of quantum mechanics relies on a complete misrepresentation of the measurement problem that derives from outdated physics and woo-peddlers. The possibility that some portions of the brain's functions are better explained by quantum mechanics than chemistry isn't outlandish, or contrary to a materialist model of the brain and mind. All of that being said, we'll still go through the other aspects of his videos, because frankly, his misuse and misrepresentations of sources and the fragility of some of those sources is funnier than the hypothesis itself, and tragically people take this guy seriously. I hope you'll join me next time as we explore the, um, evidence 
presented in the neurology episode of The Case for the Soul. Please take a moment to comment, rate, subscribe, and if you hate your own wealth, turn it over to me via Patreon. I'm an Dragon. Thank you all, and have a good night. <laughs>